We're dealing with the same subject as we dealt with this morning, uh, which is the text uh, on the Christ epistle to the church at Pergamos. And we saw a number of things this morning regarding that, but our two uh, rebukes that Christ has or admonitions to this church at Pergamos. Remember, it is a local church, but it is also prophetic in nature, looking to a period of church history. And so in these seven epistles of Christ, we are getting a great deal of church history. It's amazing today how little people know about church history. I know pastors that don't have any any books at all on church history. Uh, certainly not uh, much at all that's true, at least. But uh, I think it is an important thing for us to remember and study church history. I have many, many, many books, many volumes of books on church history, and I've always appreciated reading them. Sometimes we... Uh, know and understand the problems of our day when we understand where the foundations are, right? I've learned one thing when we're cleaning up our property is that when you are pulling weeds, you want to get to the root of the problem. <laughs> and so it is true with uh, many of the issues that we deal with today. And although we have a kind of a morphing of these doctrines that entered into the church, morphing and evolution of them that develop in all kinds of unspeakable things, really, in modern-day Christianity, uh, we know where the roots are. And here in Revelation chapter 2 in the church to Pergamos, Christ says two things. He says, you have there who hold them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, and you have them there that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Well, what does that mean? Well, they were part of the church and they were tolerating it. Why were they in the church? Shouldn't somebody have done something about this? And so it's written to the angel of the church, which is the pastor, and he's holding the pastors of this particular uh, area responsible for not dealing with the problem, not uh, taking care of this. Most of the time, when you have these kind of serious false doctrines that come into the church, if you are proactive about them and you go and talk to people about them, they do one of two things. They change their position, get it right, or they leave the church. And sometimes we you know, mourn those who leave the church, uh, and, I, and I do as well. I mourn their loss because I wish I could have been more effective in helping them. Otherwise, if I would have, could have been able to maybe do a little better job of teaching, maybe they wouldn't have left. Maybe I could have persuaded them. That's not always the case. Some people won't be persuaded. Uh, they are not going to change. And, and of course, once they get a, uh, that, that uh, spirit, they're not, going to, they're not going to do that. So tonight we're going to talk about the doctrine of Balaam. We're going to look at the way of Balaam and the air of Balaam. And that's where we're going to start tonight in Jude, uh, verse 11. Only one chapter here, of course. And here now the Bible speaks of the ear of Balaam. And it is an important portion of Scripture for us because the ear of Balaam permeates modern-day professing Christianity. But we have to remember that when you hold to the ear of Balaam, the way of Balaam, or the doctrine of Balaam, that Christianity ceases to be Christianity, right? What did Christ say? I, I commend you because you have kept my name and you have uh, kept my faith. See, those, those things were, were important to him. But when these things are allowed, then Christ's name uh, becomes corrupted. And what is that name? Christianity. Christianity becomes something now an aberration of what what it was intended to be and what God defines it by his word. So I invite you to stand. Uh, we're going to read verse 11 of Jude, and we'll have a word of prayer, and you can be seated. Now I want you to know that the beginning few words, words here, it says, woe unto them. You see that? A woe is the opposite of a blessing. 
And it comes in two forms. One is either a chastisement or a judgment. It can happen in both ways. So when uh, the epistle of Jude says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, now that's a way, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. And perishing in the gainsaying of Korah. Now, there are three different things here. We're not going to look at them all tonight. We're just going to look at the heir of Balaam. That's our subject. But Father, we pray tonight and ask, Lord, that the only one who can really teach us, which is your indwelling spirit, might have his way tonight. That, Lord, we come to understand this text and use it to your glory. Use it in helping other people as well. For, Lord, we know you've given it to us to give it to others and teach it to others also. And we pray you'd bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So let's focus just for a moment on the heir of Balaam. The heir of Balaam is the false thinking of the false prophet. And he's false because he has used his position for personal gain. So it is the false thinking of the false prophet who believe he exists to be served rather than to serve. And the false prophet uses his push position for self-glorification or self-exaltation rather than to glorify God. It is the ministry of every believer, whatever we do, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, let's all do the glory of God. We're not doing it for self-promotion, not to get a, another soul in our soul winner's uh, you know, belt buckle notch, uh, not to be able to say, well, boy, I... I prayed for this person, they got saved. I mean, all of that is self-glorification. And we have a tendency to fall into that trap. But God wants to be exalted before men. And the true prophet wants to make sure that God is exalted. But the false prophet, he wants to be exalted before the men, uh, before men. Otherwise, he wants men to exalt him rather than exalt God before man and edify men before God. So this is the anything for numbers pastor or leadership who is a crowd gatherer, not a church builder. And I guarantee you those are two different things. It's easy to gather a crowd. I could do it quite readily. I can assure you that if you give me a month, I'd fill this place up. Just takes a little compromise. Just a little compromise. Now, in Proverbs 23, verse 7, it says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So, as a man thinketh in his heart, that's what he is. What fills his heart, that's what he is. And then he makes this statement, Eat, drink, and be merry. Eat, drink, eat and drink, saith he, but his heart is not with thee. So he, he's inviting you to come in and have a time of fellowship with him, but his heart's not with you. The point is, he's doing this uh, to, so you only owe him a debt, or you feel indebted to him. So remember sometimes that some people's motivations are not good. Now, we don't question people's motives. That's not good either. But at the same time, just because someone's doing good, that does not mean their motives are good either. And I've become a little cynical over the years, and probably more cynical as I grow older, but because I've tasted of this so often. And then there is a doctrine of Balaam that uh, Christ speaks of in Revelation 2.14. Now notice the Christian is to preach the doctrine of Christ. Christ calls it my faith. So he's, that's what we're called to. Now, so in other words, we're to seek to reproduce Christ in others, Christ's teaching in others, by renewing their minds and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform their lives from inside out. We're not trying to shape them and mold them from the outside with uh, peer pressure and those kind of things, although some of that does happen. Uh, a man does reproduce what he is. And you'll never reproduce any more than what you are. Uh, he is what he really believes and practices, not what he says and teaches. And sometimes it takes a while to get to know a person. Now, none of us, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dwight Smith, always uh, used to say, we all have, uh, have, all have warts and smelly feet. Now, I don't know where he got that from or whether it's original, 
But uh, I think it's true. We all have warts and smelly feet. Uh, none of us are, are uh, in any way uh, perfect. We, we all have our failures and weaknesses and flaws. But we ought to be trying to reproduce Christ. So the doctrine of Balaam reproduces what Balaam was. The doctrine of Balaam reproduces what Balaam was, not what Christ wants, not reproducing Christ in the lives of people. Balaam very simply taught the Moabite king Balak to corrupt God's children. He comes and Balak says, here, here, you go and curse the children of God and I'll give you this monetary uh, blessing. I'll make you wealthy. Well, Bela actually went and asked God's permission to do it. God says, no, 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 no. You, you're not going to curse the children. That's not going to happen. And so instead, uh, King Balak wanted Balaam to curse because they were going to come to occupy his land. But God said no. Now, remember, he wanted to, but he could not. Now that's where the problem is. He wanted to. Why did he want to? Because he wanted the filthy lucre. And so Balaam taught King Balak what he needed to do to seduce the children of Israel into compromise in order that God would chastise Israel rather than bless him. And Balaam could then get his reward from Balak no matter what God wanted to do. So he was, he was circumvented. You see how wicked this is? You know, this whole emergent new evangelical nonsense is really wicked. It's not. It doesn't. They, they come under the guise of love, and it's all a pseudo love with false doctrine. But the doctrine of Balaam was that he taught the men of Israel to fornicate and marry Moabite women, thereby defiling their separation of themselves before God. Now, Paul had a similar problem with the believers at Corinth in, in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians. They're getting most of everything right now by his second epistle. But I like what he's talking about because they still had this pagan marriage problem going on. They were divorcing and separating from one another and, and marrying one another's wives and all of this nonsense going on in the church. And so... He addresses this in chapter 6 and 7, but he says to them, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open to you, our heart is enlarged. He said, I love you, and uh, I want to help you. But he says, you are not straightening us, but you are straightening your own bowels. Otherwise, you're, you're not listening. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, just like you were my children, be also enlarged. Open up yourself to us. Hear what I've got to say. And then he makes this wonderful statement. He says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Now it's twofold. It's a marriage issue, because they were still marrying pagans. And uh, of course, that kind of problem going on. And the second issue was they were uh, associating and fellowshipping with people who did not hold a pure doctrine. And so they were being constantly being corrupted from without and from within. So he says, for what righteous, what fellowship, what working partnership in ministry hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Well, it's a rhetorical question, none. What communion, what does light and darkness have in common? They're opposites, right? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Concord is the same kind of concept. What do they have? Belial is, of course, a representation of all that's evil. What, what concord, what, what, what agreement does he have? Or what part, he, uh, what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, a man of faith with a person with no faith? What, what kind of partnership can you have there? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Can you imagine? For you are the temple of the living God. Okay, now there's where it ends, right there, right? For you are the temple of the living God. So how can you keep allowing all of this stuff to go on? 
As God has said, I will dwell in them, walk in them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so here is the commandment. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. Now, remember here, and italicize the word thing, is italicized in your King James Bible. It ends actually with, touch not the unclean. It's referring more to people than it is to things. And the concept here is that don't get yourself involved with people who are out of alignment with the Word of God. Don't tolerate these things. Now, this was a problem here in Corinth. It was a problem at Galatia. Remember, uh, Paul had to rebuke Peter and Barnabas because they were tolerating these Judaizers at, at, at Galatia. It wasn't that they condoned what they were preaching, adding to the gospel, but they were tolerating it. And so Paul rebuked them to, to, to their face. Ended up in a, a council at, uh, at uh, Jerusalem. So he says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and, and touch not the unclean, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and be your, you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I actually had a Bible college professor in a Baptist college one time tell me that separation is not a doctrine. Separation is just a preference. And uh, I looked at him and I think my jaw must have dropped. And uh, I said, I, I think what I said, if I remember right, I said, man, that's messed up. That is messed up. And I think I just walked away. But look at verse 1 of chapter 7, because it is a continuing phrase. So having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, what are these promises? That I shall be a father to you, you be my sons and daughters. Having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, all of our fleshly sins, all of our spiritual sins, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, that is the admonition of Christ to the, those who held to the doctrine of Balaam and as well to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. But as a result of Balaam's doctrine, a similar problem at Corinth, God's children began, became involved in pagan worship and the fornication of Baalism. The the uh, not Baalism, this is Baalism or Baalism, it's actually Baal. But the doctrine uh, always begins with toleration and ends with a rapid slide into practice. This isn't anything new, this has been Satan tactics for years. He's done it through his propaganda machine for years, he gets you to laugh at it, and then makes you sympathetic toward it, then he gets you to tolerate it, and then he begins to get you to accept it as a norm. That is a whole Hegelian dialectic which is practiced every day. It is uh, Hollywood's uh, practice and it's being, uh, having whole cultures manipulated by it. What you begin to fix your eyes upon will eventually begin what you do, become what you do. You keep your eyes fixed on something to the place that you want that, you will always fall in the direction you lean. And uh, you begin open and tolerant of certain things, it's pretty soon you'll accept it as a norm and many people will fall into that same problem. Now, secondly, there was a doctrine, uh, them that held the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Nicholas means to conquer, laity or laos means people. So they were the overlords of the people. And this is a clergy laity division in the church so what at Ephesus in Revelation 2.5 was some, simply a deed, it had entered into the church, and there was a beginning of this deed, was now fully developed man-made dogma. A dogma, by the way, that Christ says, he what? I hate it. I hate it. You know that I hate the term laity. I do not refer to the people in the pew as laity, I don't refer to myself as a clergyman, nor do I allow people to call me reverend. 
because both of those are a derivative of the Nicolaitan system. It is divisive. I tell you, friends, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Now, God has ordained some that he has called to be the leaders of the church to shepherd and administrate it. But the ground is level. I'm no better than you or bigger than you. Well, maybe that might not be always the case, but uh, uh, that's just not the way it is. We're all supposed to be uh, workers together with God, every one of us. Authoritarian positions of leadership, I think, are the easiest roles of which to take advantage. And unfortunately, I've seen it. I think uh, Brother Brennan has a really good chapter on it in his book, um, Baptist Schizophrenics, and uh, does a good job dealing with that subject. So when authoritarian positions of leadership are abused by evangelists and pastors and deacons, they establish a standard with devastating results. Now, I want to confess to you tonight, I've got to admit that I have done things in the flesh. I have, I have done things I, I regret, things that I have gone back, had to go back to people and apologize for and ask their forgiveness for as a pastor. None of us are above that. And any pastor who is disqualified by one of those things for a one time or an occasional um, uh, failure in those kind of areas, except some things, um, there, there wouldn't be a pastor left on planet Earth. Every pastor that uh, have a, ha, got angry at one time and provoked his children to wrath, at one time probably every pastor has done something like that. It happens. We're flesh. We all have warts and smelly feet. But that doesn't mean that's the way we have to live. And uh, I've, I've gone to my children on numerous occasions and asked them to forgive me for my previous failures. And so have I done so in the church. But true biblical leadership always holds itself accountable to the God of the Bible first and the children of God second. And when the lordship of Christ over the church is replaced with the lordship of man, then Christianity is reduced to a cult and Christians to slaves. I don't want that. I don't want a church that does what they do because that's what my pastor teaches. I want a church that does what they do because thus saith the Lord. And they can come to the Bible and say, here's what the Bible says. And I do this because of what the Bible says. Yeah, my pastor teaches that too, but I believe it's from the Bible. My wife used to always joke and uh, because she comes out of Evangelical United Brethren, um, yeah, EUB, -E and uh, one of the things that her answer was when someone said, well, why don't you go to the dances? And she said, well, she did go to dances sometimes, but uh, she, was, she wasn't a good one, but <laughs> she is now, but wasn't that. <laughs> they would ask her, why don't you? But, well, it's against my what? My, it's, against, it's against my religion, see, it's against my religion. Not that the Bible says this, but it's against my religion. But here in the Nicolaitan system, that's what it evolves into. And it involves in what came to be known as the priestcraft, which is a form of manipulation and creates a dependency. Uh, if your salvation is dependent upon my giving you forgiveness, can you imagine what that would be like? But that is the, that is the, uh, the priestcraft, the clergy lady division of the vast majority of professing Christianity. So the priestcraft of the Nicolaitan system attempts to make man dependent upon them. My job as a shepherd is to make you independent of me, just like any uh, parent raises a child to maturity, uh, doesn't, uh, wants that child to be able to be mature enough to function on their own. Right? Now, what happened here, historically? When Constantine married the state to the church, he made the church a political form of compromise and patronization. He founded the first ecumenical council, of which has been the historical progression of the compromise of truth for unity's sake, and each one uh, since that time has been uh, a group of preachers willing to accept 
or tolerate various things. Uh, I remember one time that we had the Wisconsin Fellowship of Baptist Churches at the church I was pastoring in New Lisbon because it was the, I think it was the 150th anniversary of the WFBC. And so our church was the second oldest in the state. In fact, the fellowship was founded at First Baptist of New, New, of New Lisbon. And during that meeting of the, of the pastors there, there were two, I believe, or three churches who made a motion to remove the term militant from uh, the doctrinal statement of the WFBC. And I was quite upset by it. And uh, it bothered me a lot. But it was a blessing to see that of those three that argued for that term being removed, they were the only three that voted for it. And shortly thereafter, they all resigned from the WFBC, Wisconsin Fellowship of Baptist Churches. They all, I believe they all left that year. Now, you have to take a stand for things. And sometimes it doesn't sound like much, but militant means separation. And that would have been the destruction of that. And that's where they always attack. That's always the first level of attack is ecclesiastical and personal separation. So orthodoxy began to be defined by consensus, and consensus became purely political in its motivations or pragmatism. What got votes, what gained popularity, what produced results, that's pragmatism. And now, through this process, this is where it all ended, uh, entered into Christianity. The Nicolaitan hierarchy was a direct byproduct of this marriage, because there was a hierarchy Within paganism, you had high priests and then levels of different priests uh, within that hierarchy. And that was absorbed into Christianity. And the first thing this hierarchy did was to organize by taking away the autonomy of local congregations. You know, that's not really a big deal. Autonomy. Local church autonomy. Well, it is a big deal. It is a big deal. And then they took away the authority of local churches to confirm God's calling upon their own leadership. They didn't get to choose their own pastors. They didn't get to ordain. It was ordained by a hierarchy of clergy. Then they developed the order of presbyters. So there was an order of them. And you, you, as you came up through the church of the hierarchy, you were promoted to bigger churches and, and uh a more prominent positions, high wages, and more benefits. Bishops became the highest orders. Bishops would appoint the individual pastors who would be accountable to their hierarchy. Otherwise, they could be hired and fired. The Episcopal church government became the accepted norm. Local church problems would be appealed to the bishop. He would come in and resolve it and often fire the pastor and... Uh, uh, from there, the steady decline of Christianity and into paganism is really a matter of history. But praise God for his faithful remnant. There was always a faithful remnant. That was another generation of people that said, no, we're not going to get involved in that. When the North American Baptist Convention began to go liberal, they had churches which would leave the convention. They began to deny the verbal funerary inspiration of scripture, the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, a number of other things. I've often said they, they uh, um, had to ha have a list of denials because they didn't have anything in their doctrinal statement anymore. But they began, the churches began to separate from that whole Minnesota Baptist Association was at one time part of that North, North American Baptist Convention. And almost all the churches in that convention separated from them. Then the convention sued the local churches to gain their property. Because they believed as a convention, they owned the buildings, real estate, and songbooks. And Dr. Clearwater, as he said, we stayed in long enough to fight the fight because the real estate and the songbooks were important too. 
They were given by God's people to the local church, uh, given to the Lord by God's people, and he stayed in long enough to fight. But when they won that battle, by the way, it was won in Wisconsin by uh, a church up in uh, Wapaka and New Lisbon who took that matter to court and won their buildings. That's what happens when you have this kind of system going on. Praise God we have men who have fought that battle over the years. And uh, one of them, of course, I believe was Dr. Ernie Pickering, who was a close friend, faithful man of God. He was uh, uh, in a number of different groups. Uh, he was in the IFCA, was the Independent Fundamental Churches of America, was their national director, saw them going new, new evangelical, editor of The Voice magazine, and he separated knowing it was going to cost him dearly. And then he went to, uh, I believe it was Colorado, became the dean of a, the Denver Baptist uh, Bible Seminary. And they started going to evangelical, and he left that. And then he went out to Lancaster, again, costing him dearly. Went out to Lancaster and became uh, head of the seminary, the president of the seminary there, of the General Association of Regular Baptist Churches. But even they were going to evangelical. And he left there. And then eventually came back to Central Baptist Theological Seminary and did a good job there for many years. But when he wrote his books on separation, he was writing from the middle of the fire. He, he knew what he was talking about. He, he was writing with a fiery pen. <laughs> because that's how close it was. John, the Whit John Wickham, who taught for 40 years at Grace Baptist Theological Seminary in Nebraska, uh, saw this stuff coming into the college, into the seminary. And this great, wonderful man of God was greatly attacked and, uh, and uh, injured because of that. He, he would not stand for it. And, uh, of course, lost his position in the late years of life when, when he really couldn't afford to do that, but still had a great ministry. Uh, all I'm saying is that we have a lot of people over the years that pay dearly so you can sit comfortably in an independent Baptist church and uh, know that uh, you're being taught the truth and uh, uh, can, can be comfortable. Praise God for them. So who was Balaam? Well, Balaam was an Old Testament prophet of God, and we know a lot of things he was not, but it is apparent from Numbers 22.5 through Numbers 24.25 that Balaam was given visions, messages from God for the children of Israel. And King Balak, that's Numbers 22, uh, all, you know, the whole portion of Scripture through chapter 24, um, Balaam uh, was an integrationist. And it was obvious from Numbers 23.3, if you go there, and 24.1, that he was custom to practicing divination and enchantments. And I'll give you a handout on that next week because we're going to talk about the solution to this problem and teach on biblical separation next week. But in Numbers 23, verse 23, it says, Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. Neither is there any divination against Israel. So, so an enchantment and, and a divination were gaining aid from spirits or demons to sway public or personal decisions. And God protected faithful in, in, uh, Israel from, the, from such influences. It is the, the position of taking God putting a hedge about. He did that with Job, remember. So according to this time, it, sh it, sh it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, what, what hath God wrought? Now, God produced that. Numbers 24, 1. And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not, as at other times, to seek for enchantments. Why? Because it would have been useless in that God would have prevented the demons from harming Israel. So he didn't go to, to get it done by enchantments. But he set his face toward the wilderness. 
So God calls Balaam in Joshua 13, 22, a soothsayer. <laughs> now he really corrupted himself. He began as a prophet of God with the gift of prophecy. Otherwise God revealed things through him. But he was integrating. He was integrating these pagan ideas in with his uh, beliefs towards God. It says in Joshua 13, 22, Balaam also the son of Beor, the soothsayer, did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them. And although it seems apparent that Balaam believed in Jehovah, it is also apparent that he had adopted the practice of heathenism in manipulation of their gods, their demons, that's what their gods are. By the way, if you worship an idol and you pray to an idol and the idol answers your prayer, that's a demon that's doing that, not, uh, not the idol. But uh, to get these false gods to do what they want them to do. Now, this is obvious of Balaam in that after he was directly instructed of God about what God wanted from him, he began to try to manipulate the situation to be able to have what he wanted any, anyway. So that's the idea of the pagan idea about God. The pagan idea about God is that, you know, they're just like we are, only they're gods. They cohabit, uh, you know, they'll fornicate with your women and, um, you know, practice incest and all the other things that go on that's uh, in, in, in uh, human life. Uh, they, you know, that's, that's all the nonsense that comes along. They don't really have any ethic. They're, you know, they do what they do for their own selfishness. That's, that's what he had now brought this idea to God. So Balaam wanted his way, not God's way. And to the pagan mind, there is no moral ethic or absolute from their God. So they could manipulate their gods to change a God's mind so that a person got what that person wanted. You can't do that with God. God's not going to change for anyone. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. Neither is there a shadow of turning with me. That wasn't so with the pagan gods. They could be manipulated. They could get, get them to change their mind. So they also used divination and enchantments to see into the future and manipulate the future, to manip manipulate people, circumstances. So divination was a magician's art. And other terms were this were a medium. That was a person who was able to communicate with dead people. Uh, a necromancer. That was, well, we, I'm going to tell you what that is. We have kids here tonight. <laughs> a familiar spirit. That was another term. He, he's, he has a familiar spirit. Another term was a wizard. And then a soothsayer. Their practice was that of witchcraft and sorcery. That's all become part of our culture today. And most of our children, you let your children watch Disney World or uh, most of that stuff, uh, Harry Potter and uh, even most of the Star Wars movies, all of this stuff is just filled with that kind of stuff. And uh, it is all directly connected to paganism. Now you say, well, that's pretty radical preacher. That's all harmless. Not, not really. We have a lot of generations that have grown up with it. So the term divination presumes that some divine, at least supernatural being, would be providing the information to the heathens. Any supernatural being was considered divine, even if it was Satan himself. So Balaam was an integrationist because he believed in the true God, used pagan practices to determine God's will. Wow. So in Numbers 23.3, he had offered a sacrifice. Perhaps this is what is called haruspicy. Uh, that is where you cut an animal apart and you interpret things from the animal's innards. Then he went to a high place to look for a sign in the sky. That's called augury, to interpret an omen or a portent. So he was practicing all of this stuff. So the heir of Balaam is defined by two phrases in verse 11 of Jude. Ran greedily and for reward. Central to the heir and the practice of Balaam was his heir in thinking. His paganized mind allowed him to manipulate his position to his own benefit. 
And he believed he existed to be served rather than to serve. He was preoccupied with reward and his heart was filled with greed. And he saw the, the ministry, his prophecy ministry, as a means to that end. We read that in Proverbs 23, verse 7. Or, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Balaam lived under the false assumption that God would curse Israel just to meet Balaam's selfish wants and desires. And God's will, as is evident from Balaam's responses to God's direct instruction, was not Balaam's real concern. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have tasted hatred over the years in the ministry. I, I have, I think the worst treatment I've ever been, uh, ever been experienced in my life is at the hands of other Christians. At least they profess to be. I, I, I never could imagine that people who named the name of Christ could do some of the things that they did. And, and and justifying it as a matter of righteousness. So the way of Balaam was his own way. He had his own agenda, his own methodology. And for him, it was tried and proven by his own experiences, and therefore it worked, pragmatism. Don't try to argue with the pragmatist. He says, well, you're not going to do it your way. Your way doesn't work. Uh, my way works. I get, I get what I'm trying to get. I said, oh, I've, I've told people like that, I said, well, maybe what you're trying to get isn't what God's trying to give. See, that's, that, that, that is, he, 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 it worked until he met with the God of Israel in the plains of Moab and this side of Jordan by Jericho in Numbers 22. And the way of Balaam is an attitude towards God that results in pragmatic practice, and this practice is called a way. A way, but it's not God's way. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but my me. Proverbs 21, 2, every, man, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. When, it, when a man's way, he says, well, that's, this, this, this works. <laughs> it's right. When this works, it's got to be right. I'm amazed at times over the years I've got something to work because I've figured something out and got it to work and have some old guy who's been a professional at it for all his life and he comes over and said, why don't you try it this way? I said, wow, that's so much easier. <laughs> that is, wow. Wish I'd have known that 30 years ago. But I had figured out my way and it worked, but it wasn't the right way. Why wasn't the right way? Because it wasn't the best way. The way of Balaam is defined by two phrases. He has forsaken the right way and are gone astray and who love the wages of righteousness. This is also defined to some extent by God's actions in Numbers chapter 22 in the following verses. Look at verse 22. God's anger was kindled because he went. And he was going to go back and do what God told him not to do. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he is riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. So he's a prophet. He had two servants. So he's doing pretty well for himself. But he's riding upon the ass. And then in verse 23, it says, The ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. Did Balaam see it? No. But the ass saw it. And his sword drawn in his hand, the, the, the ass saw this. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field, and Balaam smote the ass to turn her, in the, turn her into the way. Otherwise, to get her the way he wanted to go. And there's, there's a metaphor here for us, isn't there? Sometimes God has put a, a break in our pathway to get us to turn another direction, and uh, we just push forward, push through it. So God's way is always defined well. And uh, if men only stop and look and listen. Now remember, uh, Numbers 22, verse 20, 24. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyard. Now look at this. Wall being on this side and a wall being on this side. And there's an angel of God standing in the middle. And uh, this ass stops that he's riding. It stops because he sees the angel with the sword in his hand. 
It's amazing how blind people can be to God's leading and direction to one extremes that they will go to have their own way. Look at verse 25. Numbers 22, 25. When the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself onto, under the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. I've had that happen. Uh, you got a horse, that's one of the ways that they'll try to throw you off and uh, they'll push you up against a tree real hard and break your leg. And uh, so what does Balaam do? He, he smote her again. And uh, the angel of the Lord went further and stood in the narrow place. Otherwise, the, the wall's getting narrow and, and so you can't get around him. Uh, where uh, was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. Otherwise, it's right there. You got to stop or die. <laughs> and when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. That's another trick. That animals, you, you, anybody who's ridden horses, you know, you break a horse and they're running along. They'll get going as fast as they can. They drop down to their knees, slide on the grass, and you go flying. Well, that's what this mule did, this, this, uh, this ass did. And uh, so Balaam's anger was kindled and he smote the ass with a staff this time. You know, he'd beaten her. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And she said unto Balaam, can you imagine? <laughs> Man, this guy, he's got his, he wants his way hard, he doesn't he? He wants to do it his way. And uh, so the, the ass opens up uh, its mouth and speaks. And it says, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do this unto thee, to do so unto thee? And he said, No. He said, Have I ever done anything like this ever before? Balaam's a good example of why the faithful Christian service must be patient with those that oppose themselves. Balaam forced his will, even against God's direct intervention, to keep Balaam from doing what, uh, doing wrong and ultimately lose his life. But that's where he finally ended up, right? And that's, of course, with 2 Timothy 2.25, that we are in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. So only God was finally able to open up his eyes and God was trying to stop Balaam from the ultimate consequences of his own stupid lust. If you're going to be unfaithful and you want your way, remember there's an end to that destiny. There's a destiny at the end of that road. And it's not going to be a pleasant one. Now, yes, our sins are judged in this world. Our sins are judged uh, in eternity and paid for, but uh, our failures in this world are judged in time. The Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, verse 31, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and he saw it drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? He holds him accountable for what he did. Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displease thee, I will get me back again. False repentance. I, I want my life saved. I, I don't want to lose anything. False repentance. Balaam's response, if, I, if it displeased thee, I will get me back again, shows he saw, but still interpreted what he saw from his own agenda. See, reception is not the same as perception. And Balaam would simply seek another of his own ways to get where he wanted to be. And repentance by a limited degree is not true repentance. If you just repent just enough to get by, I've, I've seen people do that. That's not repentance at all. 
There's a brokenness in genuine repentance. Not because you're going to get punished or because you got caught. There is a brokenness before God. Because you have failed and you've grieved the Holy Spirit. That's not here. Revelation 2.14 but I have a few things against you because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balak, Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling stone before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Balaam could not get God to curse Israel, so he taught King Balak what to do to get Israel to bring God's hand of correction against them. What happened is detailed there in Numbers 25, 1 through 18. We're not going to read that whole text. But understand this, the way of Balaam is the broad way. It is the way of the hireling prophet who makes merchandise of his gift and the people of God. The way of Balaam is the way of pagan, pagan integrationism and spiritual pragmatism. Second Peter 2, 1 says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily or covertly shall bring in damnable heresies, even de denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. But that's not a problem. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. 24,000 people of the congregation of Israel died because of the way of Balaam before he was killed by the sword. Joshua 13, 22. Balaam also the son of Beor, Beor the, the soothsayer, did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them. Oh yeah, Balaam got what he deserved. But 24,000 others died. Compromise is expensive. And it's bitter. It's bitter to the children of Israel who many of those people lost dear friends. 24,000 people who were deceived and led astray. Oh, it's probably because that they were weak, weren't doctrinally sound, we're already thinking and leaning in that direction. But nonetheless, and they died because they began to fornicate with the women of, of Moab. Sad, sad story. But the leader, uh, remember the leaders, of every insurrection has a leader. It's always somebody leading the pack. And it's like what Peter says, they come in privily. And they hide. And uh, they always take the simple ones. People who aren't trained. People who don't know any better. People who are doctrinally weak. They are babes. They, they just have the milk of the word. They aren't, aren't able to take the meat of the word. And so they're the ones that get taken captive. Make sure you're not one of those. Make sure that you are very careful about your knowledge of both the name of Christ and what it stands for, what it means, and the faith of Christ, which are his doctrines. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be truly furnished unto all good work. Father God, as we bow tonight, we thank you for the admonition here and example of this church that you give us. And Lord, we know that we are individuals of great frailties and even our own weaknesses, weaknesses theologically and, and uh, other things as well. Help us to be strengthened each day and each week and each month of our lives to be um, better prepared 
to understand the times in which we live and give an answer to those who ask us of the reason of the hope that's in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Clay, you come and close us tonight with a hymn.